This is NASA TV. You're looking live at the Crew Dragon spacecraft on top of a Falcon 9 rocket set to launch four astronauts to the International Space Station in a little less than four hours. But right now, they're live inside the room right here. Crew 4 astronauts getting their spacesuits on. And this is a live look inside that suit up room where the crew of three Americans and one European astronaut are completing their checkouts of their spacesuits. Welcome everybody to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for live coverage of NASA and SpaceX's launch of Crew-4. I'm Daryl Nail and I'm with Megan MacArthur, astronaut from Crew-2. You were the pilot in that mission, so it's great that you have that experience and that you're here to share it with us because you know this mission well, but you also flew the space shuttle. Absolutely. Um, it's always exciting to be at Kennedy Space Center on a launch day. I'm super excited to see my friends getting ready to fly. They all have big smiles on their faces, and it's going to be a great time watching them get ready tonight. Absolutely. And it all started when they woke up today at 8.37 p.m. yesterday, because we just rolled over midnight <laughs> into Wednesday, but it was Tuesday just a few hours ago, and that gets everything rolling. That's right. It's a, we think of the day as starting sort of at launch time, but in fact, they've been up for many hours going through um, some weather briefings, some last minute checks, and as we see them right now going through the suit checkout. And this is the suit up room, a historic room inside the operations and checkout building, the Neil Armstrong operations and checkout building at the Kennedy Space Center, where astronauts have been getting ready for launch, going all the way back to Apollo 7, and then in this building, back to Gemini 3. It's a remarkable, it's a great feeling when you walk into the room and you recognize the history that's taken place in that room. Um, visually, it looks, it does look different than when it, uh, when we use the room for shuttle. Not tremendously different because the purpose is still the same. You're still getting into your spacesuit, making sure everything fits where it's supposed to, making sure the suit um, has its pressure integrity checked, and that's what they're going through right now. So this is really kind of the beginning of that buildup of excitement that's going to continue for them throughout the night. Absolutely, and each one of the crew four astronauts is in a seat that is molded exactly as it is in the spacecraft, right? That's right. So the, the cushioning that you see is can be changed out based on the size of each individual astronaut, and the idea is that that seat is going to cradle you through the various dynamic phases of flight. So the, you want it to fit, it, fit you pretty well. And you can see the SpaceX suit techs there with them. Uh, monitoring both on laptops, but then also interacting with the astronauts. Can you believe it, Megan, that you were in that room uh, just about one year ago? It is, it's hard to believe. In some sense, it feels like it was yesterday, but in other ways, it feels like it was a lifetime ago. Yeah. But watching them go through this now definitely brings back all of those memories and those feelings from being in that room and, and having that excitement build. So let's get to know Crew 4 uh, just a little bit more. This is the fourth rotational crew to fly on a commercial spacecraft, and each astronaut brings a diverse set of experiences to today's flight. And that astronaut that you see right there sitting in the chair, let's start with him. That is Dr. Chell Lindgren. He was born in Taipei, Taiwan, but spent most of his childhood overseas in England, which he very much appreciated. You'll hear more from him about that. He was an instructor and jump master with the U.S. Air Force Academy and also has a doctorate in medicine. And he served as a flight surgeon for NASA. After he was chosen as an astronaut, Lindgren flew on Soyuz and spent 141 days in space during Expedition 44 and 45. He has a wife and three children. And today, Megan, he is the commander of Crew Dragon. That's right. He is going to make an outstanding commander. He's a wonderful, talented person, obviously experienced at living and working in space, but also just a really good human. Up next is fellow airman Bob Hines. There he is with his visor open, communicating with his suit tech. He was born in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He has a wife and three daughters. He has a Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering and served 21 years in the U.S. Air Force as a test pilot. He was also a fighter pilot. He flew the F-15E. He came to NASA as a research pilot where he flew science missions in our WB-57. Today, he's going into space for the very first time as the pilot for NASA SpaceX's Crew-4. Megan, you were the pilot 
for crew two. It's a position you know well. That's right. It's, well, it's an extremely important role, Daryl, <laughs> as I'm sure you know. Of course, um, because you did it. <laughs> uh, I first got to interact actually with Bob um, when he was an instructor pilot for T-38 for the astronaut corps. And so flying with him was always a pleasure. He's always calm and collected no matter what the circumstances, which is exactly the person that you want uh, piloting any vehicle that you're in. And uh, they're going to make a great team today. Now let's introduce you to the two mission specialists, Jessica Watkins, and there she is, looking calm and collected and not moving very much, but very focused, I imagine. She considers Lafayette, Colorado her hometown, a talented rugby player in college. Her team won the national championship in 2008 when she was with uh, her university, I believe it was Sanford. Um, Watkins was a postdoctoral fellow in the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences at the California Institute of Technology. She completed several internships with NASA, including one testing system designs for the Mars Perseverance mission at JPL. She became an astronaut in 2017, a turtle. We'll talk more about that. And now, just like Bob, she's going into space for the very first time. This is a brand new experience for her. Yep, it's a bit of a turtle takeover, I think, is what we're experiencing uh, on Space Station right now. But Jessica is an outstanding crew member. Um, it's been fun to get to know her since she arrived with her classmates. Um, just tremendous amount of knowledge that she brings. Um, can be very focused and serious on the task at hand, but uh, boy, when she smiles, it really lights up the room. I think this crew is going to have a lot of fun together. The second mission specialist is Samantha Cristoforetti. She was born in Milan, Italy, but now lives in Cologne, Germany with her partner and two children. In 2006, she earned her fighter pilot wings and flew the AMX attack fighter at a base in Italy. In 2013, Christopher Eddy launched into space aboard a Soyuz for a long duration space flight to the International Space Station. So she has quite a bit of experience aboard station. Several years later, she was awarded the Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Merit from the president of Italy and today, she returns to space and the space station with Crew 4. Another very impressive resume, um, but also a really just a great person to be around. So they're going to really work well together. Um, they've gotten to spend several months together training and getting to know one another. And I think this mix of uh, experience and skills is going to blend really well and make for a successful crew. So now let's check in with our team monitoring preparations for launch at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We're going to NASA's Dan Hewitt and SpaceX's Jesse Anderson. Take it away. Hey, thanks, Daryl, and hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Dan Hewitt. Thrilled to be back here at Hawthorne for another crew launch. Yeah, and I'm Jesse Anderson, a production and engineering manager here at SpaceX, and per usual, super excited about Crew 4 today. Welcome to Mission Control in Hawthorne. This is where the teams are staffed around the clock as we count down to liftoff. Now on console or headset in Mission Control are six key positions. The mission director is in charge of the room and tasked with making real-time decisions to ensure mission success. The person that you'll hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, which you'll hear us refer to as the core throughout the broadcast. The additional positions are focused on vehicle systems, including avionics, navigation and control, software, propulsion, life support, and communication with ground support teams. And NASA has its own team members back in Mission Control Houston. We're going to check in there a little bit later where they're preparing the space station for Crew Dragon's arrival. And we're going to meet several of those key players when we do check in. Now today's ride to the space station will take about 22 hours with Dragon flying autonomously the entire way. And just like autopilot on a commercial aircraft, the crew always has the ability to take manual control of the spacecraft if needed. Now at T minus three hours and 39 minutes until liftoff, let's go to Andy Tran for an update on the launch countdown. How's it going so far, Andy? Things are going good, Jesse. We are coming up on T minus three hours and 30 minutes, and um, things are going well for launch. At T minus four hours, there was a briefing by the SpaceX launch director, and good news, there's really nothing significant to report on the rocket. Everything is re looking really good for tonight. Earlier in the night, the team began clearing the hazard area and buildings around Pad 39A, known as the Blast Danger Area, or BDA. The only people remaining on the pad are the ones needed for ingress of the astronauts, and crew arrival is expected to happen in about an hour. As we look live here at uh, one of the Teslas and uh, members of the media and family members gathering, you can see in the, in the left-hand side, Administrator Bill Nelson, NASA's Administrator, former Florida Senator, 
uh, here in the state of Florida. And next to him is Bob Cabana, the former uh, director of the Kennedy Space Center and current associate administrator uh, working out of headquarters now, uh, helping Administrator Nelson lead the agency. See Kelvin Manning as well to mm -hmm. his right. And here comes crew four down the hallway. All right. On the left, Bob Hines. On the right, Jell Lindgren giving a good wave. Look at those smiles. Great smiles. Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti. And Bear in the ele elevator they go. Look at all those signatures, Megan. You can see them on the wall. Folks who have supported this program. Yes, I remember that when we got into the elevator. And it's such a good feeling. Um, we don't often get to interact with the thousands and thousands of people that make it possible. And it's so nice to see that um, just tangible evidence that they're thinking of us. And it you know, reminds us, of course, we all are always thinking of them too, but it's a nice reminder of how large and how dedicated this team is. And now we look at the doors for crew four awaiting their moment with their families before they go out to launch pad 39A, a historic pad here, where their rocket awaits them, as well as their spacecraft, the Crew Dragon Freedom. And the gull wing doors of the Teslas now opening. There they there are. There they are. <laughs> Four, count down one, right the three, astronauts three, of Crew three, 4 minutes. getting ready to go out. to space, taking their first steps off, off, outside from left to right. Jessica Watkins, Bob Hines, Chell Lindgren, and Samantha Cristoforetti. Oh, what do we got here? One, two, three, four! Nice. <laughs> and a cheer before they go off to space. I like the huddle. That was a nice little touch. Very nice, yes. Oh, you're going to KLI from here. And here's that moment, Megan. It's a wonderful moment, just seeing the smiles on the faces of your loved ones, knowing that they're there for you, that they're excited for you. It's really special. Our helicopter will follow the entire way as the convoy pulls out. You can see the SWAT vehicle in the background, and now the families and loved ones come in. Yes, they get that up-close view one more time with their loved ones. Um, and that's really special. Any last um, little messages you want to share privately or just uh, hands up against the glass? It's a special moment. And Megan, the plate for uh, on every car of the Tesla is go for launch. <laughs> As we can see, the custom uh, plate. This has become a tradition yeah, I like uh, to it. do uh, on, the, uh, on the ride out to the launch pad. It's a nice touch. And there goes our convoy rolling out to the launch pad. The last 10 miles, a 20 minute drive. They won't see much in the dark, but this is the way to space. Yes, this is a nice relaxation moment. You've just gone through a happy scene, hopefully, but an emotional scene nonetheless. And this is a little bit of a time to Kind of lean back in your chair a little bit. Um, for me, it was blaring some favorite songs. Um, and at nighttime, that was fun just because of the, you know, the darkness and then the different lights that you see. It was kind of a neat visual experience. But it's just a time for a little bit of relaxation before the next phase of the journey. They have arrived. There's been a, a lot of upgrades to this launch pad, Megan. You flew it and flew out of there under both configurations, both as a space shuttle astronaut and as an astronaut on Crew Dragon. That's right, and uh, we get an opportunity to tour the launch pad with a family member in the days leading up to the launch, which is really special. But other than that, we don't spend a whole lot of time on the launch pad, so getting to see it for us is always a very special thing as well. Um, it does look very different now um, under the under the new owners, uh, but you can still see the bones of it, of the historical structure that was there supporting the, all those shuttle launches. Speaking of bones, that metal, black metal to the left, we're panning around it, but that is the old rotating service structure that mm -hmm. used to have that gigantic structure that would you know uh, contain the cargo bay of the space shuttle so you could get in and out of it, service right. it, 
uh, it would rotate out. Still part There's of it there on the pad. On we're at T minus two hours, 59 minutes. Crew have arrived at the pad. We are on schedule. So this is uh, one of my favorite moments when the crew gets to first look up at their rocket uh, ready yeah. to go. That's Chell Lindgren and Bob Hines giving a look, and That's right. Bob looks a little giddy. Yeah, <laughs> he's pretty excited. Look at that rocket. <laughs> yep, I like that sort of characteristic, the lean back, the look up together. It's a good, uh, it's a good look. And the wave as they get ready to get into the elevators to ride up to the top where the crew access arm is, which will take them to the spacecraft. It is the original elevators. They've been, of course, renovated, but those are the same elevators you got in, Megan, as both a shuttle astronaut and a Dragon yep. uh, crew it's member. Another piece of history. Hopefully at this time of night, they won't be taking up too many mosquitoes with them. Walking down the crew access scarm comes Bob Hines and Chell Lindgren. We see them inside and the shot to the left from the outside. Love that shot. The closeout team not far behind. And here come Jessica and Samantha. Big They'll walk smiles. down the crew access arm with broad smiles. <laughs> well, Samantha is saying something, not sure what she's saying, but uh, she is smiling. I think they could about smile their way into space. Just on the energy alone. That's right. The white room also allows for uh, completion of cargo load at T minus 24 hours. So it has use to both get the astronauts inside the crew capsule and uh, to get that late stowage. This is part of the countdown that we call ingress, a milestone that we have reached at uh, inside the two hour and 42 minute mark. Simply means that the astronauts are getting inside Crew Dragon. The closeout team surrounds them and is preparing them to go inside. They have covers on their boots that make sure everything is kept clean upon entering the capsule. Uh, Samantha flashing us the Crew 4. And so each of the crew members, they're doing the signing. They're also getting what's known as a FOD check, a foreign object debris check, just making sure that they're not bringing any dust, debris, particles, things like that in that could interfere uh, with the umbilicals or any of the different systems, because anything that goes in that capsule is going to space for the next six months. Yeah, really exciting to see Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti signing their names. Uh, and they do have this in the procedure uh, to have the Sharpie ready for them uh, so that they can do this signing before they ingress the Dragon vehicle. Looks like now they both have signed their signatures and next steps is to start ingressing the Dragon capsule. Yep, we've got Chell and Bob in already. And when we get a look in through the hatch, the seats are numbered one through four. So when you're looking in from the hatch, it goes from right to left. Uh, so that seat all the way on the right will be seat one. And that's where Samantha Chris Ferretti is bound. Uh, just to the left of that is seat number two. That's the commander seat and Chell Lindgren already seated there. Next to that, the pilot seat, seat number three, where Bob Hines is gonna be riding uphill. And then Jessica Watkins will be in seat four all the way on the left. Uh, and these seats have a connection point to the suits. They've got an umbilical, basically a, a hose almost, that uh, plugs into the leg of the suits, and that provides a couple of really critical functions for the suit. It uh, gives them a hardline connection to communications uh, through the Dragon spacecraft. It also provides uh, the capability to flow just conditioned cabin air to help them stay cool. Um, so. Uh, performing a similar function to that blue box we saw them carrying earlier. Uh, but then one of the really critical ones uh, that all of the different umbilical points can provide is pressurized nitrox. And that's to 
Uh, if these suits need to be pressurized for any reason, we can flow that in. If they're in a depressurized cabin, if there's issue with the atmosphere or anything like that, that suit can provide a pressurized safe environment for the crew members. And you can see on your right hand screen that all four of the crew members are now sitting in their seats. Uh, you can see the suit techs there helping them get strapped in or harnessed into each of their seats and their umbilicals uh, attached to their suits. Um, and every part of this process uh, is very precise. Uh, you did see uh, as the crew uh, ingress through the hatchway, the suit techs even put their, their hand over their helmet. Um, that's a part of the procedure, again, to make sure that they're, you know, they don't damage anything as they enter the vehicle. Same with as they're uh, putting together their um, harnessing. Um, again, every step of this process is very precise, and uh, we might be able to see it in a minute here, but they do have uh, some tablets and some pads with them where the, the crew can follow along with every procedure, every step of the way. Well, thank you for those social media questions. Keep them coming. Shuttle Gravity asks, why have many of the SpaceX crewed missions launched at night? That's funny, you and I were just talking <laughs> about We were talking just about this. talking about that. Um, I'm not sure that we came up with the answer. Uh, it certainly is the I case that, that launch, well, orbital mechanics <laughs> are complicated. That was my answer, yeah. Um, I think uh, you know we we definitely came to the agreement that it's a beautiful it's a beautiful site. Um, it could also it, well it's certainly orbital mechanics where the space station is um, uh, is is important and um, I think also probably weather might be in general the winds might be calmer at night um, by the ocean but that's that's really just a guess. Um, it's not something that I've tracked closely. I don't know if you guys have it, talked about it internally. It is and the c conditions are better at night but it's exactly as you say it, it does come down to where the space station is going to be and how they need to catch up with it. And so when we land at night, uh, the launch ends up happening at night, it's just the way it is. Yeah. And uh, that's why we're spending our entire overnight <laughs> getting <laughs> ready right. for this launch, <laughs> which it, it's interesting that they, they noticed that because Demo 2 and Crew 1, um, Crew 1 I'm a little fuzzy on, but I think yeah. those were daytime, but Crew 2, Crew 3, Crew 4, mm -hmm. all overnight. All overnight, that's right. But you notice that the Axiom 1 mission which uh, you know was just about two weeks ago, that was during the day. So, oh. you yeah, know, re it really so just really depends. So really, what I what I remember from shuttle days is that as the launch ch gets later, the time gets earlier by about 23 minutes or something like that, yes, day by day. Right. So you used to be able to do that launch math pretty quickly if you knew the mission had slipped a week, it was going to be so much earlier. So it really does have to do with where is the space station relative to the launch site, and you got to launch right when they're directly overhead, and that's, exactly. that's how we do it. And it's an instantaneous window right. when it is overhead. When Crew 4 arrives at the space station tonight, they'll officially become Expedition 67 flight engineers. Once on board, they'll do something known as a direct handover, just like what astronaut Megan MacArthur was talking about, basically saying that Crew 3 and Crew 4 will be aboard the space station altogether until Crew 3 comes home sometime next week. Crew 3 will be able to, sh to give Crew 4 an orientation, show them the ropes, which might be particularly helpful for first-time space flyers Jessica Watkins and Bob Hines. A direct handover also helps ensure a continuous U.S. presence on the space station, a record that we've held for almost 22 years. But the space station is an orbiting laboratory and they'll jump right in on research investigations. So I'll toss it over to Megan Cruz, who can tell us a little bit more about those exciting experiments the Crew-4 will work on. Chelsea, thank you so much. Yeah, I want to introduce everyone to David Parker here. He's the European Space Agency's Director of Exploration. How are you? I'm great. Good morning to you. <laughs> you are very excited. Well, I do know why you're excited. This is your first launch from here at Kennedy. It is. It's incredible. I've been working in the industry for 30 years, and here I am, the first launch at Kennedy. That's so exciting. And you're going to watch uh, Samantha Christopher Reddy's second trip to the International Space Station once she launches from here. When she gets there, she'll be working on a lot of science experiments, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, she'll be working in our uh, European lab aboard the space station, that's called Columbus, mm -hmm. and she'll be continuing many experiments that have been started, but some really interesting ones for her mission. For example, she's working on uh, DNA research uh, and related to aging, and that's related to one of her own interests, which is osteoporosis, the effects of aging back here on Earth. So mm -hmm. it's linking what we're doing aboard the space station to the research uh, that's really relevant to us back here on Earth. We're getting ready to send Crew 4 to you. How are you getting ready for their arrival? 
But uh, funny you ask, because actually just yesterday we caught the visiting vehicle Cygnus, uh, the SS Pierce Sellers, and brought it on board the space station. And on board that uh, that space vehicle is a whole bunch of supplies for Crew 4. So uh, yesterday evening and today we've actually been unpacking it. And part of the supplies that it's brought up are food, clothes, uh, and other items for Crew 4. So we've been starting to distribute those around the station, uh, pre-position them for them. And then when it gets closer in time to them or showing up, we'll actually start to unpack those bags uh, and set up their crew quarters for them. That's right. Phil McAllister, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. So talk to me about this being the fourth crew rotational flight to the International Space Station. What kind of milestone does this represent? Well, it represents that we've been working on these vehicles for, it was 10 years in yeah. development. So now after all that development, we're actually flying and it's very gratifying. And to have four missions within two years, it's really kind of amazing. And it's really picked up the pace and uh, it's just what we were working for. It is T minus 47 minutes and counting. The SpaceX launch teams are finishing final review of data from checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director is about to pull the team for readiness, both to load propellant and to launch. Uh, and the exciting thing is this is the last pull before we lift off. The seven SpaceX engineers indicate they are go by electronically voting on the online countdown procedure. The launch director also checks in with Dragon mission director and NASA launch manager to make sure that they are also ready. We are proceeding with the crew arm uh, movement. Um, so that access arm that is uh, adjacent to the vehicle, that's going to start to uh, move to its launch Call position. Officers and fire and four and FCCX. The control will be in a lockdown state until the launch escape system is disarmed. It does take a few minutes for the crew access arm to fully retract, and after that, we'll be arming the launch escape system. So on screen, you can see the Dragon capsule with the crew access arm still in the surface position. Uh, the crew is crew on access board. arm retraction has started. So great, we got an amazing shot of the crew access arm retracting away from the Dragon capsule. So again, this is going to take a few minutes to fully retract, and then the next major activity is going to be arming that launch escape system uh, of the Dragon vehicle. So far, weather and range continue to be go for launch. Uh, we are monitoring the clearance area around the launch pad as well as air and sea space around the flight corridor. Here at Kennedy Space Center, the conditions are predicted to be acceptable for liftoff just uh, about 43 minutes from now. Propellant load has started. There you hear the call out that propellant load has begun. A big milestone. As we are sitting at T minus 34 minutes and counting, but you were saying, Megan, Yes, yeah, so it was. It's nice to have some new faces, quite frankly, yeah. and, to, and to hear some new stories. Um, and like I said, though, we really did not work with them. They worked exclusively on the Russian segment, um, and so it did not disrupt our ongoing science work that, of course, we're doing. That's so important for for our international partners. So um, I think it would be difficult to to carry out a movie production as well as carry out the actual work of the space station. Just another example of the, uh, you know, continued private use of the International Space Station, and I guess you didn't photobomb their, their shot? <laughs> I did not, no. I stayed okay. safely behind the camera, <laughs> or in the other room entirely. We're, we are now T-minus 33 minutes, 57 seconds, and counting away from the second launch of a Crew Dragon with people on board in 2022. Today we'll begin the next six-month rotation mission to the International Space Station. The launch escape system is armed. That happened just before we started loading the propellant onto Falcon 9. The Dragon capsule, though, it, it was loaded with its propellants about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road at a facility SpaceX calls Dragonland. In order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. So for the fuel, SpaceX uses monomethyl hydrazine, or MMH, 
and nitrogen tetroxide, or NTO, for its oxidizer. And together, those propellants feed the Draco engines that maneuver Dragon on orbit. All right, we're coming up on two minutes until liftoff. Standing by for stage two LOX load being completed. Stage 2 lock load is complete. Dragon is in auto idle. Alright, Dragon's flight computer in auto idle. Next it'll flip yeah, so over to countdown. Gas closeout has started, so we're now isolating all of the feed lines for the different gas systems uh, from the Falcon 9 rocket. They're going to then get vented. You can hear that venting start. They're going to get vented overboard. Uh, through the through umbilicals and through the strong back itself. Coming up at T minus one minute, we're going to hear Dragon is in countdown. It's a uh, flight computer will switch to countdown mode. We'll also hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is armed. Falcon 9 will move into startup and take over control. FTS is armed. Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling. Dragon is in countdown. Dragon's flight computer in countdown. The FTS, that flight termination system on. Freedom, SpaceX, go for crew four launch. Freedom is crew four launch. SpaceX reports go. Crew reports go. 30 seconds. You heard it there. 30 seconds away from liftoff. T minus 20. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. And lift off. Go Falcon. The Freedom Ring. Has to be through four. Copy one alpha. Freedom soars and the dragon flies forth. Vehicle already pitching down range. All nine Merlin engines have to win. Getting good performance on stage one propulsion already. We are T plus 35 seconds into the fourth rotational crew mission on board Dragon and the Falcon 9. The nine Merlin 1D engines uh, on the first stage are beginning to throttle down, you want to throttle down in preparation for max Q. This is where the vehicle will experience the highest amount of aerodynamic pressures. So we'll throttle down the engines in preparation for that event. Vehicle is supersonic. All right, so we've passed the speed of sound. We're already... Max Q. Uh, and there's our call out for Max Q. Stage one, throttle up. So right after Max Q, we will begin to throttle Stage those engines up again. Copy, Copy one, one Bravo. And one Bravo, so we're in the second and final abort mode for the first stage. Continuing to get good performance though, the crew already pulling in excess of two Gs. And coming up next is gonna be a couple of events in rapid succession. Yep, in about 10 seconds here, we're gonna be performing engine chill on the second stage and back engine. Um, and then in about a minute, uh, we're gonna start off with Miko, also known as main engine cutoff. This is where those nine engines that you're seeing uh, ignite on, uh, being lit up on screen, those are gonna cut off and in and preparation for stage separation, where the first and second stages will separate from one another. And then the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage will ignite and continue to carry our crew four astronauts to orbit. And we heard that MVAC chill has started. Stage one, throttle down. The nine Merlin engines starting to throttle down. And standing by for Miko. And 
Stage Miko. Stage separation confirmed. So Miko, stage separation is confirmed. Stage two operation. We see that Copy second two stage alpha. engine light. We're in two alpha, the second abort mode. The second stage is lit, continuing to carry the crew four astronauts onto orbit. Uh, and this is a fantastic view on the left hand side. This is the first stage now yeah, separated from the second stage, but it's still being illuminated by that single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, so right now the first stage is making its way back to Earth to attempt its fourth landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. Uh, the crew is on the opposite, opposite side of the engine that you see on the right-hand side of the screen. They are continuing with their journey to outer space. Seeing good performance on that lone Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage. The cruise G-load dips right when we hit that separation event. It's gonna continue to build up now. Third acquisition of signal Bermuda. That means we're Guardian, now SpaceX nominal trajectory. Freedom copies nominal trajectory. That was our guidance, navigation, and control officer. Nominal trajectory. Dragons pointed in the right direction, continuing its flight to orbit. We heard Bermuda called out. That's one of the ground stations now receiving telemetry from the Dragon as it continues its path uphill. So we'll, be, we'll have the dueling boxes here for a while as the first stage makes its way down. That second stage gonna continue firing until about uh, a little over eight minutes into the flight. Doing the heavy lifting now. The first stage has um, a couple of events itself in order to, to land on a drone ship. So uh, at T plus seven minutes and 25 seconds, it's going to start its entry burn. It's gonna be one of two burns. Uh, this is where three of the nine Merlin Dragon engines SpaceX, nominal trajectory. on the first stage will relight uh, and burn for about 30 seconds in order to slow the vehicle down before hitting the denser parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Acquisition of signal to Hampshire. All right, now on the New Hampshire ground station, another call out there from our guidance, navigation, and control officer, nominal trajectory. Second stage H2 continues to power. Nominal. Call out just then, propulsion is nominal, the engine performing as expected. Crew pulling a little more than one and a quarter Gs right now. Again, that's gonna continue to ramp up, peaking just before we get to that second stage cutoff. Yep, this, this, this single engine here, Dan, can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space, so um, they are definitely feeling it. And we're already about 200 kilometers in altitude. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. Three copies, nominal trajectory. Great call out that. Uh, we are headed in the direction that we need to, and we, we just heard from Shell, the commander. And we should get one more of those trajectory check-ins in about 30 seconds from now, and then we'll start to hit our events in rapid succession as the first stage continues to make its way back home. And the second stage will start to wrap up its job of delivering these astronauts into orbit. Yeah, we don't see it on screen right now, but the first stage is making its way back to our drone ship uh, in about- Dragon, SpaceX, nominal trajectory. In about 30 seconds here, it's going to start its entry burn. And there was the other call out that uh, you, you were mentioning, Dan, about the trajectory. Things again, continuing to look very, very good for the ascent portion. So for those just joining us, we are just under eight minutes into flight. 
We have four astronauts as part of the Crew-4 operational mission. You can see on the left-hand side, this is our first stage with three of nine Merlin engines reignited and slowing down the first stage before we hit the denser parts of the Earth's atmosphere. So this first stage has one yeah, more burn left. Burn shut down. Down. That's going to happen just before the T plus nine minute mark, and then we'll attempt a landing for the fourth time on a drone ship that's currently parked in the Atlantic Ocean. So is that entry burn complete? Terminal, Terminal guidance. guidance. We're in the final stages of the second stage's flight into orbit. We're about to pass through several of the different abort phases, which essentially correspond to areas along the very northeastern seaboard of the U.S. and then across the Atlantic and off the coast of Scotland. But continuing to get call-outs that stage two propulsion is nominal. Copy, Shannon. And the call-out of Shannon, Ireland, that's indicative of our final abort zone. And after this uh, second stage engine shuts off its engine, we are going to be listening for the confirmation of a good orbit, which tells us that the yeah, crew yeah, and Dragon are where they need to be in Did orbit. Landing bird. Bird. Dragon, SpaceX, nominal orbit, orbit insertion. insertion. And that was the call that we wanted on the second stage. Here's a fantastic yeah, view. We're glad to be in orbit. Of the Dragon, first SpaceX, stage. Fantastic view of the first stage. Landing legs have been deployed, returning back to Earth for a fourth time. And just like that, a fourth landing is part of the Crew 4 mission. You can hear the applause behind us. But prior to this, Acquisition signal New Finland. we saw the crew, we, we heard that the crew uh, has been successfully inserted into a good orbit, and this is them uh, in zero G, uh, yeah. two of them for the first time. And getting a look, it looks like we might have a couple of zero G indicators. I see a turtle in Bob Hines's hands. That is the nickname for the astronaut class from 2017, of which he and Jessica Watkins were a part. I believe we've got a monkey floating over by Samantha Christopheretti. <laughs> but first, <laughs> first view of crew four on orbit, experiencing microgravity. They're still attached to that second stage, which at this point is gonna continue to coast for a couple of minutes. It's got small reaction control thrusters on the upper part of the second stage that can be used to cancel out rates, essentially making sure that they're on a stable coast before we get to that separation event, after which we'll see Dragon Freedom flying free for the first time. So though the crew, uh, as we see them here inside Dragon, uh, they have separated from the second stage, but uh, they still have about a 16 hour journey before making it to the International Space Station and docking tomorrow, or today, later on today. Um, but it is so great to see them uh, flying free in space. And we did get confirmation that that nose cone deploy sequence has started. So again, those six hooks that hold the nose cone in place during uh, the launch and ascent portions have to retract. And then the nose cone will be able to start to swing open and deploy. And that will uh, uncover a number of critical systems for Dragon's flight up to the space station, uh, not the least of which... Freedom, LD, I hope you enjoyed your ride. It's been an honor flying with you, Chell, Farmer, Samantha, Jessica. Have a safe journey to the space station. Say hi to Crew 3 for us, and we'll look forward to seeing you when you get home. Indeed, the dream is alive. Now some words from our CE. Dragon, CE, you privilege having you fly with us. Good mission. We'll see you later. And uh, from uh, Freedom, we want to thank a uh, big thank you to SpaceX, the Commercial Crew Program, and specifically the Falcon 9 team for uh, a great ride. It is a privilege to get to fly this new vehicle, the Crew Dragon Freedom to Orbit. Huge thanks to the teams that assembled and prepared her for flight. 
We're feeling great and looking forward to the view.